All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Kerr, I'd like you to tell me a little bit about what this series is about and how it came to be. Yeah, sure. There is a group uh, called L&L Research. Uh, it, it consists of uh, three individuals, Don Elkins, uh, Carla Rukert, and, and Jim McCarty. And the, the group had been around for many decades with, G with uh, Carla and, and Don, but it wasn't until Jim joined the group in 19... 81, that they started channeling uh, an entity called Ra, and over the next three years they held uh, about 106 sessions where Don would ask the question, Ra would answer the question, and these 106 sessions ended up being in four books that they published shortly after. And then it wasn't until 98 that uh, they decided to publish a fifth book, which kind of consisted of some of the material that was a little bit on a personal note or maybe you know a little far off topic so in these five books the, the basic concept is Don will ask a question Ra will answer that question always starting the question off with I am Ra now I guess the next question is who is Ra? <laughs> Ra is uh, introduces himself I'm gonna say him he they everything but you should know that you know that it really is a they and I'll explain that in a bit, but Ra introduces themselves as a social memory complex, right? And what is a social memory complex? Well, social memory complex, the best way to think about it is it's a group soul. So at some point in our conscious evolution, we, a group of individuals, decided to exist as one hive mind, I guess you'd call it. It's, it's kind of like the Borg for you Trekkies <laughs> out there without all the nonsense of assimilation kind of thing. And it makes sense, because if we're all part of one thing, which is what law of one teaches on our journey back to that one thing it makes sense to group up along the way so Ra the short answer is this Ra is a social memory complex consisting of six and a half million souls from the planet Venus which is a small group small group <laughs> some brothers and sisters <laughs> <laughs> so channeling yeah so when Carla brought it through, she brought it through a medium called channeling. Yeah. And so, do you want me to describe that? Or? I think it's, yeah, you know way more about channeling than I do. You should, you should take that one. Okay. So, channeling, we all actually do it. We just have different levels of capability with it. And, and um, it can be anywhere from you get a sudden inspiration and you start working with that inspiration to create something or do something on up through who's familiar with Edgar Casey? I think a lot of people know Edgar Casey. He was full full on trans channeling. And so with the trans channeling you're really, really, really deep and you get much more pure information. But uh really we all channel at times. We really do and we just don't always realize it. <laughs> but it really is, it's just about bringing information through and then you become the medium or the instrument that the information comes through. So it comes down and through and out, and then you're channeling. Different kinds, like different, you know, levels of it, or? Well, yeah, there's definitely different degrees of it. So if you're, I don't know, you get inspired and you're doing something, and, and we like to say on a scale of one to ten, one, a level one would be, I don't know, I get a sudden inspiration and I want to do something, or I've said something to someone, and but I was like, where'd that come from, you know? And then you, all the way up through, you're in a trance, not, uh, not many people do that, but there are people who do trance channeling where they are literally not conscious of what they're saying and that becomes the full on number 10 channeling. Which ability. is what Carla did, full trance. Which is what Carla did, yeah. yeah. Which takes quite a toll, in her case, took quite a toll on her body. That's right. Yeah. Jim actually is the, one, the only one that's still alive from the three of them. Um, Unfortunately, but LNL still exists today. You can go to their website. I think it's lnlresearch.org. Mm -hmm. I think so. There's another great website too. We should mention it's um, lawofone.info. Toby Wheel Wheelock put that up years ago, and it's it's really great. It's it's a, it's kind of like a Google for the Law of One. You type in anything you want to learn, and it will give you a list of anywhere that word is mentioned. So if you want to do a quick search, it's a great place to great place to study. And of course, David Wilcock. I mean, people are familiar with him. Yeah, of course. Uh, his site <laughs> also has some Law of One stuff on it, a really great study guide. So, yeah, it's good, good info. 
So tell us more about what was Ra trying to get across? What was the main message? Yeah, the, I mean, the elevator pitch of the Law of One basically is very simple. It, the Law of One just says that all things are one. All beings are, are one being. You know, that you are everything, every being, your every emotion, every situation. You are unity, you are infinity, you're light, love, love, light. You are, period. That's the Law of One. And that's as simple as it's going to get today, right there. <laughs> but we need more time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess, you know, I'm curious about, for me personally, the idea, when I first got into all of this, the idea of we're one. Like, what does that really mean, you know? Because I'm here. This is me. What does it mean to be one? It literally means we are all one being. See, it's difficult to explain because we're in what you would call a third density where there's a veil of forgetfulness. So we really don't remember our true entire self, that we are literally one being, you know, at that much higher level. It seems like we're walking around and we're individuals, but we're, we're not. I mean, that, that's an illusion, you know? I mean, I think that if you talk about it from the eyes of the standpoint of the Creator, it makes a lot more sense because that is the ultimate one. You know, and I often think about that. It's my wife and I, Lisa, have talked about this. You know, when we were kids, we had this weird I, we always had this weird thought, like what what does if there was nothing in the universe, what would that feel like? Try and wrap your mind around that for a second. If there was nothing, I mean the feeling of loneliness, you wouldn't be able to compare yourself to anything, you know, not throw yourself up against anything and be like, you know, what am I? Well, I've always thought that if we flip that over and we say the exact opposite, what would infinity feel like? You know, what if you were everything that existed? In my mind, it would feel a lot like nothing. Hmm. Because if you're everything, you can't say, okay, that's a cup, but that's, I'm everything, so that's part of me, so that doesn't give me an idea of understanding what I am through understanding what that is not. You follow me? So if, if that's the case, then how do you... What are you going to ask yourself? If you're that dude, and you're, you're hanging out in space, and you're everything, right? I, we're going to ask ourselves all the same questions. Who am I? What am I? What is this path that I'm on? What, what are we doing here? What is the purpose? And I think in the beginning, that question was asked, right? So in the beginning, we have infinity. And this is directly from the Law of One. In the beginning, we have what you would call infinity. At some point, that infinity became aware. And Ra tells us that you may call that awareness intelligent infinity, or the creator, the one infinite creator, whatever you want to call it. A lot of people call it God. It's that energy that is behind everything in life. And we know this. We feel this. We can feel that even through the veil that's there, right? So if you're this one creator, what you, you want to know yourself. I mean, that's the whole point of all of this, right? So what do you do? Well, you have this desire to know yourself, so you create this game board, this stage, if you will, of what we're going to call the universe. And actually the Law of One uh, says that the multiverse theory, which is kind of springing up in theoretical physics right now, is quite valid. There are an infinite amount of universes. We're going to shrink that down because uh, I don't even want to, you can't wrap your mind around it. You can't even wrap your mind around our own universe. <laughs> so what happens is, so what happened was the one creator um, created this universe. And I guess we'll talk about how that happened. It's a long process and then sent all these individuated pieces of consciousness, or seemingly individu individu individuated pieces of consciousness, out onto this game board to do nothing but have experience, because they're all part of the Creator. So the whole purpose is, is, to, is for the one Creator to understand what it is through all these little individu individuated experiences to eventually come back and rejoin with the Creator, all the while knowing that almost everything we're talking about today is going to be a paradox. Because it, it appears to us as though we are individuated souls, but we're not. We're part of that one big creator. You know? And uh, actually, a good example is um, we take, um, what is your name? Jo Joanne. So Joanne is here, and she knows the law of one up and down. She's read all five books. She's excited to maybe learn some stuff from Jennifer and I or share some stuff that she knows with the crowd later. That's your experience that you're having for the creator, right? 
And then we have uh, somebody in the back row, let's call him John, and he doesn't know what the Law of One is. He's never heard of the Law of One. He's never read the five books. You know, he's just here to see the dude from Dawson's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> another valid experience, completely different from what's going on up here. But it's, it's another valid experience for the Creator. And that goes for everyone sitting here tonight. You're each having your own, let's call it relative truth. That goes for everyone on the planet right now having their own experience, whatever it is they're doing, all for the Creator. That goes for everybody in the universe. That goes for every conscious entity in all the universes, everywhere, every second, having that experience so the Creator may understand what it is. It's crazy. It's crazy. To, you can't wrap your mind around it mm -hmm. because it's so huge, because we're such a small piece of it, yet we're everything at the same time. Yeah, it's really hard <laughs> to put your mind around that. But how did you come into this information, and how did you come to this? Like, tell me a little bit about your story. Well, the law of one specifically, I, you know, I, I've been researching ufology and spirituality and consciousness ever since I was this tall. You know, at a young age, I just kind of had this weird feeling that things just were not right on this planet. I couldn't put my finger mm -hmm. on it, but it got me asking the right questions, and, you know, 30 years later, here we are. Still don't have it figured out, but I'm working on it. <laughs> um, anybody ever hear of the Hidden Hand Forum? I, I, I don't even know when it happened. It was, pro it was probably around five to ten years ago, but I came through it through some book that I had read. And basically, it's one of those forums. And one of the people posting on the forum was calling them, they had the handle uh, Hidden Hand. And he was posing or claiming to be somewhere within the deep state Illuminati. Um, cabal structure that wasn't even human, very high up in, in the system. And one of the people asked, and his, his, I should state that his, um, his answers were spot on, precise, well thought out. I mean, they were, it was, that's why it attracted you know, so much attention. Somebody had asked him, well, of all the channel material that's out there and available to human beings, like what really is valid? What is the most accurate? Uh, he said the Seth books, mm -hmm. which a lot of us have probably read. And then he said the Law of One or the raw material. Now at this point, I hadn't come across it. So, you know, any good researcher writes down every single piece of material they come through and when they read something, and it was the next thing I read. And I, I mean, you know how complicated this stuff is when you read it for the first time, but it resonated with me to such a degree. I mean, it answered so many questions that I had. Mm -hmm. It gave me a structure of how all the little puzzle pieces fit in, and I just became a different person. I mean, it was... You ask my wife, I mean, I was walking around the house, and she was like, well, what, what, what happened? <laughs> and it was like this realization. So that, that was my introduction to the Law of One. And when was that? Not too long ago, really. It was uh, 2013, maybe? 14, somewhere in there? Yeah. Wow. And I've been, it's constantly on my mind, ever since. Not constantly. Well. <laughs> <laughs> most of the time. So... When we're talking about being pieces of the one, being being the one, being part of the one, experiencing this reality to give feedback to the higher part of us, whatever that is, that comes into a whole lot of other things that the Law of One talks about, mm -hmm. um, the book series. So we can talk about free will, we can talk about the distortions and all of that. So. Yeah, the distortions, uh, those are the first things that came about. You know, you're the creator, you're setting up this game board. Well, how am I going to do it? Mm -hmm. we're, we're, are we going to have some rules here? We've got to have some rules. You know, it's going to be a physical world, so we've got to figure some things out how it works. So uh, you should de define distortion, really, before we go. It, it basically, distortion is anything that seems as though it's apart from the creator, which is pretty much, from our point of view, just about anything you can think of. I mean, it's a thought, it's your partner, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. a very broad it's a definition, and it's what Ra uses to express just about anything in the books, because from a sixth density point of view, everything is a distortion, you know, just about everything. So it's important to define that at the gate. But the first thought the creator had when setting up this game board is, well, what needs to be in place in order for this to really work and set up all these experiences? And the first one was what we're going to call the first distortion, which is a free will. You know, you, you need to have the ability to choose for yourself in order to have these experiences, right? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you're being told what to do, well, so what? It doesn't mean anything, you know? You need to have free will. 
And from that came the second distortion, which is the distortion of love. We could also call it logos or L-O-G-O-S. We'll get into that maybe later. But uh, love, you could say love is more of an intelligent energy and it's something that you feel behind everything. It's a little different than the, than the energy of intelligent infinity. It's kind of on its way to being manifest. Hmm. It's kind of somewhere in, in the center because the next distortion is light, right? Light uh, is the building block for anything that's manifest. It's, you know, the photon is the base of, of everything, that, everything that we know, right? <laughs> so those are the three distortions, and they kind of play on one another. One cannot exist without the other. So with those three laws in place, this is able to happen. There's one more distortion of confusion, but that's just going to be nothing but confusing until maybe we talk about some stuff later. Maybe we'll, we'll tackle that one. So I guess let's talk about, too, the uh, the densities, because you mentioned right. sixth density. I'd like to get into some of that to try to figure out, you know, with raw coming through, were they even experiencing distortion? Like, when does distortion end? I, I don't, well, if we're talking about densities, I guess distortion would end when you rejoin the creator, and we call the seventh density the gateway density, so it's not really known. Ra themselves don't even know what happens, really. It's just they're kind of guessing based on whatever information they've been able to accumulate over the billions of years they've been in existence. So I think why don't we just go through one through eight. It's an octave, um, and it's all about raising your vibration, so it's interesting to throw it up against music, your music, musical scale, for those of you that play. You know, if you're at middle C, and you go up to C4, that's eight notes. There's eight octaves, and each one is a little bit higher vibration in terms of sound, right? That eighth note, that second C, is actually the beginning of the next octave. So it's really, and we don't know, Ra mm -hmm. doesn't even know what happens. It's thought that we just do it again, because it's all infinity, right? Which is a scary concept in itself. This just goes on and on and on forever. <laughs> but let's talk uh. about yeah. Uh. Let's talk about the seventh <laughs> density. So you have your first. The first density is. Um, let's talk about it in terms of Earth too. What happened with Earth? So the first density was a density of elements. It was when the it was when the Earth was first being formed. You know, it was literally air and fire forming Earth and water, creating land and sea, basically a platform, game board, or stage for more complex life, more conscious life to exist on and have all these experiences, mm -hmm. right? Ra tells us in the books that uh, for us that took two billion years, first density. Second density is the longest density by far for us, it took 4.6 billion years. And that's a density of, of growth and awareness. It's basic awareness. It's like a reptilian awareness. It's plants and trees and animals. You have the ability to fight for your life. It's that instinctual survival mechanism. And it's, you know, reproducing kind of, kind of awareness. Um, 4.6, I mean, every time I say that number, I'm like, yeah. it took a long, long time. But it's all prep for the third density. Now, what do you need? What do we think we need for third density? Well, body for sure, but consciously, what do you need? Yeah. Self-awareness. Yeah, you got to be self-aware, or you're not in third density. So when you become self-aware, that's when you begin to have this kind of experience that we're all having right now. Now it's important to note that we are at the end, the very, very end of this density, and it's one of the reasons why we're all here today. It's because you feel that new energy of moving into 4D. Um, so we'll be talking about that later too, I hope, because that's mm. really why we're here. I don't want to get too much into third density because we really need to get into that in more detail, so let me just glaze over the other ones. So for third density, it's very specific. Ross says that third density is a 75,000 year period broken up into 25,000 year parts. Very, very short time, but it's also an accelerated time of growth and of learning and of all these experiences we have because of this veil where we don't really know who we are. We gotta try and figure it out, you know? Fourth density is a density of love. It's understanding love and compassion to its utmost ability. Ra says for them on, on Venus, it took them 30 million years to get through uh, fourth density on Venus with lifespans of roughly 90,000 years. Now, you gotta understand, 
once you get out of third density, it's all out of time, so it's very difficult to talk about a time, a linear timeline, because he talked. They talk about mm -hmm. time being uh, a, more of a circle kind of thing, which I, I can't even really wrap my mind around, to be honest with you. But uh, it's just no, it's outside of time. Fifth density is the density of what they call wisdom. It's balancing out that love that you learn in fourth density. Sixth density is the density of unity, where all this kind of really comes together. And then seventh density is um, the gateway density where you rejoin the creator. You're almost there, aren't you? <laughs> Me? Yeah, right. <laughs> Hardly. Well, so let's talk more about third density, since we're on this topic a little bit. Let's just dive into what, why are we here in third density? Like, what is this all about? Well, I mean, we've been, we, you know, our consciousness has been through first and second. We've done it. We don't remember it, but it, it's already there. That's why we can ex we, we're still experiencing it. You know, we, we've been there. We see it. We, we, we uh, experience it. So, uh, do, I, do we want to talk about third density first, or do we want to talk about maybe some logo stuff and how the, the, the galaxy was really set up, because it'll make maybe more, a little bit more sense? Okay. okay, so let's do that. So remember when I talked about distortions um, a little bit earlier, and the distortion of love, and the distortion of the logos? So that logos is what's at the center of our galaxy. It's at the center of every galaxy, but it's, a, it's an energy of love that consists of all of the densities at once. It has an awareness, it has an intelligence, it's a lot smarter than we are, and it's set up this game board of the Milky Way galaxy for us to experience. And then from that, all these, all these stars you know, surrounding the, the logos in the center, those are also logoi of that particular logos. The Earth planets around each one of those stars is a logos. We are sub-logos. It's all in reference to what you're, you know, if we're talking about what we are in terms of the logos, then we're like a sub, 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 sub logos. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's how all the, it just went out and the energy just individuated itself into all these little bits and pieces. It started out big, got smaller, 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 until we actually have, well, all of it's having an experience. One of the cool things that I've always thought was neat, because I'm kind of a science nerd, um, and I like numbers, and there are there is a, lo uh, a lot of numbers. There's a lot of numbers in, in the law of one, because you know, let's face it, the universe is mathematical. It mm -hmm. really is um, specifically geometrical. Um, one of the things that Don asked Rye said, "Okay, all right, I get the logos concept. How many stars are in our Milky Way galaxy?" You know, so this is going to be cool information. Ra says, uh, "250 billion, approximately." That's a huge number, right? Mm -hmm. And then Don keeps going further. Okay, so what, out of those 250 billion stars, how many planets surrounding those stars have life that is aware regardless of density? So there's an awareness to the life regardless if it's first through seventh. And Ross says 67 million. Mm -hmm. Now that's, in terms of the whole picture, that's not a big number, but in terms of us sitting here in the room, it's a huge number. Right. Don breaks it down even further. How many of those 67 million, how many of those planets um, have just have, to, have achieved first density awareness? And Ross says 17, uh, 17%. How about those that have achieved second and first density? 20%. How many have achieved where we are, where we are in third density? Ross says 27%. So of 67 million, that's 18 million planets out there that are at the same level of awareness, going through the same experiences on their own timelines, not 75,000 years, it's different on every, on every planet. I mean, that's, that's a lot of worlds out there that are just like us. Now, I'm not saying they're a five-point, you know, upright, bipedal being, although, according to some of the study that I've done, that yeah, most of the beings in our, in our galaxy are of the star mm -hmm. figure, the two legs, two arms, and a head. But 18 million is a big number. And then Don said, well, how about, four, how about fourth density? Uh, Ross says 16% and fifth density is six. And of course, sixth and seventh density, you don't exist as a physical being, your uh, energy, your light. And there's no planetary requirement. So if you add those percentages up, that's 80, I think it's, it's either 84, 86%. I think it's 86%. Don was a scientist, he picked up on this. He said, well, what about the remaining 14%? And Ross says, interestingly enough, 
I cannot tell you that it will violate the law of free will or the law of confusion. So there's some information there about our own galaxy that we can't know because it'll change our timeline. It'll ch it's too much information for us. I, to me, I'm just like, I, that, those are the pieces of information I just drool over. I love that kind of thing. Well, I find it interesting, too, that in the book they talk about how they can't really make themselves known right now because it would violate the law of free will. It, it would, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people ask that question, well, why don't they just land? Why don't they just... They've done that. They've done that, and it's part of the reason why they're here. There's a couple of reasons why they're here. One is because the three individuals in the group, Don, Carla, and Jim, they created some kind of alignment within their energies where Ra was able to come through because he wasn't before. They weren't before. They actually say we require a very specific narrow bandwidth, I think, are the words that they used. So that's one of the reasons they came through. The other reason is when they were in third density on Venus, which was a long, long time ago, they were helped by a sixth density social memory complex such as they are today. And that helped them tremendously move into fourth density. So they assumed that would help us They've been here several times in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I'll talk about one specifically. It was during Egyptian times, 11,000 years ago. And they literally landed. They, create, they came here through thought. They created their aircraft through thought. It was a bell-shaped kind of craft. Their bodies were tall. They had a golden glow to them. They interacted. They walked around the earth. They taught the law of one to the pharaohs. It stuck. But the problem was the pharaohs and the more powerful people in society, they kept the information to themselves. They did not distribute it to the common man. And it's part of the reason why we're in the situation that we are today with the deep state, Illuminati, New World Order, whatever you want to call it. So they're karmically tied to us. That's why they're here. They said that they cannot move into seventh density without helping us into fourth density. So I find that you know, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Their mission. It is their mission. Yeah. Wow. And here we are. And here we are. <laughs> All right, so is this the point where you want to dive a little bit further into third density? Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. All right, so third density uh, is tricky because it, the, whole, the whole thing's an illusion. It just is. If you look at from the bigger picture, every, everything, all of this is just, it's just a big illusion. I mean, if you even get inside this table at a molecular level, there's so much <laughs> space between the center of an atom and wherever its electron is supposed to be. You know, the science keeps changing. Now it's everywhere at once until you look at it, and boom, there it is, which makes sense to me. Um, <laughs> the, if you were to blow an atom up to the size of the sun, this, the, the nucleus of the atom, and the ring at which the, the uh, electron was sitting on, it's like going from the Sun to Pluto. That's a tremendous amount of space. This is not even solid, yet it is solid to us because we're so kind of pulled back from it. You know what I mean? So what I was talking about earlier was third density, you're underneath a veil. And that veil is placed there for, for a very good reason. It's placed between the conscious and the subconscious minds and it allows, it, this allows us to not remember who, you know, who we are in total. Because if we knew who we are, we wouldn't want to change anything. We wouldn't want to have the experiences that we need to grow and learn for the Creator, because we'd already be, we already know we are the Creator. So it's all about getting back to that knowledge. Third density is also about a choice, and it's a very specific choice. And this is really some of the most important things about the Law of One. There's two choices. And we're going to call one choice service to others and the other choice service to self. This is the meat and potatoes. Mm -hmm. We can call the service to others choice also of the positive polarity or the, uh, the service to self uh, a negative polarity. And it's important to note that there's nothing negative about the negative polarity. It's like two ends of a battery. They need each other to exist, right? We live in a world of duality. Without duality, we can't understand hot if we don't understand if we haven't experienced cold. It's possible. So duality is very, very important here. And that's actually a great time, the law of confusion, which is one of the laws I wanted to talk about. Don't let me forget where I was, because this is a <laughs> tangent. Right? I, I, tangents try. really I, I can't do it. I can do it too though. <laughs> I know. Don't don't let me forget my spot. Um, the law of confusion, there's two parts to it. it, it Rob will not tell us anything that takes away from the illusion. It's, it's 
maintaining the truth within, it's maintaining the belief of the illusion, the truth in the illusion. I love when you just keep shaking your head. I love that. No, I love it because I'm like, okay, I'm making sense. It's good. <laughs> so it's about maintaining that illusion. It's also about above third density. I shouldn't say above. It's just, you know, higher consciousness mm-hmm. outside of third density. It's about that balance between the positive and negative polarity. Because again, without that balance, you can't have free will within right. this little realm of ours right now. So that's what the law of confusion is. And Rob quite frequently says, sorry, man, we can't answer that question. It's going to violate the, the law of, of confusion, which just makes me more confused. What was that? Positive versus <laughs> negative. And right, right. What is all yeah. that about? Right, right. <laughs> so we've got these, <clears throat> these two paths, and, and some numbers are going to pop up again. Ross says, okay, in third density, you need to make a choice. You don't need to be aware of the law of one. It's not important, but you do need to be aware that at some point you're on a path to make a choice. The choice is, are you going to be in service to others? Are you going to be in service to self? And Ross says specifically, if you're going to be in service to others, you need to be thinking, doing uh, about someone else 51 or greater percent of your time. Now, that's very specific, and it's hard for some people to wrap their minds around, but you've got to remember, it's all about the balance of energy. 51% 51% is over 50%. So if you're thinking about someone else at more than half of your time, you are in service to others. And it's not about the action. If you do something for somebody and you you are, I don't know, uh, what's the word? I'm not regretting it, but um, you feel like you're doing it because you have to, mm-hmm. or you don't have the right consciousness behind it of, of love and just, I just want to help this person, doesn't count. Like you if you're doing it for recognition. Yeah, or yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. If you're doing it for the ego or something like that, it really, truly, you have to have that conscious, consciousness behind it of, I'm, I love this person, and I'm doing it for them. And here's a paradox. Why are you doing it for them? Well, the other person is other self. Ra uses the term other self quite a bit because it is you. We're all one. Remember, that's, that's, the, that's the end game. That's the end realization. So by helping someone else, you're actually helping yourself. By loving someone else, you're actually loving yourself. Now, the negative polarity. Ra says in order to achieve negative polarity, you have to be thinking of yourself 95% of the time or greater. Now, that we all know a, a lot of narcissists out there and, and people that just think about 95% of the time. That's tough to do. I don't know anybody that bad. That's a tough one. And Ra says the negative polarity is a difficult path. Oh, do you know somebody? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> no. <laughs> so these, and again, I just want to state that is not. It appears as though that kind of person is bad, but they're not. We need them. There needs to be these two polarities, or this whole system just breaks down. These are the kind of people that control, that have no desire to serve anybody but their own egos. Uh, they control through. Um, I mean. You name it, slavery, mm-hmm. mind control, whatever. It's the people that are at, you know, it's the problem right now for us that we're finally overcoming. We'll talk about that a little bit later, maybe. So you have these two choices. There is a third option, and that's no choice at all. And that's okay. You know, not all of us are going to be polarizing positive or negative. The, the people that don't pol- polarize, Ra calls it kind of no man's land, like in between the 51% and the 95%. I guess we should talk about where each one ends up. Yeah? Harvest? Yeah, yeah. My favorite word, harvest. <laughs> We're ready for the harvest. The harvest. It has a <laughs> negative connotation to it. You know, for those of you who studied Dave Wilcox's work, he felt the same way, uh, you know, and he, he avoided using the word harvest for a very long mm-hmm. time. And I, I remember watching this one video on him saying why. And it, it, I feel the same way. It has a negative thing to it that I don't, I don't really care for. But then he said he, he read the book of Matthew, and there's a lot of references in there to the harvest. It was a parable that Jesus was talking about, right? And it was all about the law of one. And, you know, someday there's going to be a harvest, and man, he'll be here, and then he won't be here, and blah, blah, blah. So... It makes sense because Carla, who was the channel, right? They use the channeler's vocabulary, whether it's limited or not. <laughs> um, Carla was a devout Christian. So this was one of the words in her vocabulary that she felt fit. So Ra used it, and that's why it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like this. So what is the harvest? 
So like I said, third, de third density uh, is a 75,000 year period. And Ra says that we are at the end of it as of 2011 would be the switch. We know this because in 81 they said in 30 years we will be um, in fourth density. Ra says that the 75,000 year period is broken down into three 25,000 year periods. And at the end of any one of those 25, the end of the first one and the second one, if you're sufficiently polarized, you can choose to do that yourself and move in, in the fourth density. But at the end of the 75,000 year period, everybody's being moved, everybody's being harvested, because Gaia, Earth herself, is moving into a fourth density, which is what's happening right now. So Don asked the question, well, okay, uh, at the end of the first 25,000 year period, did anybody get, was there harvest? And Ross says, no. Nobody. Nobody was conscious enough yet. Well, how about at, after 50,000 years? And Ross said, no, there wasn't harvest. He said there were about 150 South American individuals that were highly polarized in the positive direction, but they chose to stay and help humanity uh, you know, with, with their uh, conscious ascension. At that time, uh, just some figures I'd like to throw out. At that time, 25,000 years ago, there were 345,000 people on the planet, and they were living approximately 900 years, 900 year lifetime. That's part of the problem with us, is that we don't live long enough to become aware of. Um, so now we're at this end of that 75,000 year period, and because Gaia herself is moving in the fourth that already has, really. Um, we're all being harvested. Positive polarity, this is what happens. The Earth herself is moving into fourth density positive polarity. So if you are of that polarity, you stay. If you're of the negative polarity, you will be moved to another fourth density planet of the negative polarity. If you are you haven't made the choice and you're unaware of it, you will repeat third density on another Earth-like third density planet. Those are the rules. I'm just the messenger. I don't I don't know why. I don't know how. There are what what, what I don't like is that there's a couple things that Rob says is because they're unclear about how mm -hmm. this harvest happens, and that's mm -hmm. always the question, mm -hmm. right? So they do say that it is a group phenomenon. That scares the hell out of me. <laughs> they also say that um, you must, this body must die in order to incarnate into fourth density, which also kind of scares the heck out of me. So it suggests some kind of cataclysmic event that's going to seem horrible and all this, but really it's just part of the process. And it's going to be a beautiful thing if and when it happens. Um, I think, you know, we can talk about it a little bit, a little bit later with Corey and, and uh, Dave's work. Because if they really get into that stuff. Well, and if you think just how many times have we actually been through the dying process? Right. Right. I mean, many. Death yeah. is just a. It's just a transition. You know, if you can wrap your mind around that, it doesn't become. I mean, it's always a big deal because we're all we're all scared to death of it, pun intended. But. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just had a vision. <laughs> bad joke. <laughs> Final destination at the very end. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I just remembered that that what? just came right what in. What <laughs> Have you guys seen Final Destination? Oh, you have to see it. Final, final frame of the film. I actually in that movie, I actually um, survives. I sur spoiler alert <laughs> from a movie from 2001. Um, <laughs> I was supposed, I did survive, and then we came back because I played the real jerkamo in the, in, in the film and. They came back six months later, and we wrote the whole ending. They got, the jerk's got to die. So it ends, I think we're in France, and the sign is coming in behind me. And I go, what sign? And boom, <laughs> last frame of the film, I get killed. No sequels for Kerr. <laughs> yeah, that's okay, sequels suck. <laughs> yeah, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> It was the best ending. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it has Velveeta all over it. It's full cheese. Oh, it's great. <laughs> what sign? What? Yeah. Who's next? <laughs> she woo. That was awesome. Best acting That ever. was a cool movie. It was. Best acting? I was like <laughs> two years old. <laughs> Could knock my way out of a wet paper bag. It was great. Um, all right, where do we want to go next? I guess, should we hop on into Dave and Corey? Yeah, sure. So, 
and then maybe more about just kind of what's going on in the world and yeah um yeah this is some really interesting stuff you know a lot of you said that you follow david wilcox work and to me he, i have a lot of respect for the guy he is um genius i don't know if you've read any of his books but a couple of them are new york times bestsellers and he's got all these shows going mm -hmm. and he just keeps vomiting all this crazy information to me I, it makes a lot of, to a lot of people it makes a mm -hmm. lot i mean it's it's deep deep stuff and it's yeah. very science oriented but what i love about dave is that it's all rooted in a foundation and that foundation is a law of one mm -hmm. you know he came across the material i think he said it was in 96 he actually lived with Carla and Jim around, I think he said 2003, somewhere around there, for a few years. Only individual to ever do that. He was the first person to walk into um, Don's room. Don died in 1984. Wow. He said it was untouched, just like, you know, they let, uh, to me that's really, yeah. really wow. cool, cool piece of history. Well, I like how he, he brings everything and puts it together. Yeah. So all the different things that I've been interested in, you know, with spirituality yeah. and... Yeah, the cabal and you know the the stuff going on in the world and quantum science, you know he, he kind of fits it all in very nicely together and it makes sense of things that otherwise doesn't make sense to me. No, and he you know he talks a lot about you know this new area of space that we're in, which is why Gaia is moving into a, f a, f a fourth density. You know it's um it's really incredible stuff. You know because it, it's like you know a lot of people don't think about this, but you know, the Earth rotates on its axis, then it rotates around the Sun, but then the Sun's rotating around the Logos at the center of the galaxy. And if that's thought to take 225 to 250 million years to make one loop around the Milky Way. So that means we are in different regions of space throughout that entire time period. So we are, the Earth itself is actually moving through space in relation to the center of our galaxy at 500,000 miles an hour yet it feels like we're sitting still, which I think that's pretty amazing. Even with our own gal our own solar system, I think we're moving at like 64,000 miles an hour. Anybody check me on that math? I don't know. But uh, I think that's the number I remember. So we're actually, we're literally in a new area of space for us, and it's a higher vibratory energy. It's not, it's thought of as like a cloud, more protons. I, it, nobody really knows, but it, it, it's important to note that it's a, it's a higher more intelligent energy. Gaia herself has moved into it, and that's why this harvest is mathematically where it is. It's like a clock. You know, the universe is very, you know. Mm. So we have these. We have this harvest. We either polarize positive and we go with Gaia. We either polarize negative. Or we have to get out of here because we're not compatible with the energy that is coming in here. And I think a lot of us can feel the change. People are waking up. Well, that brings me to, you know, everyone thought the world was going to end in 2012. Right. So what do you it, view I, as what, what's happened? I think it was a transitional point. It mm -hmm. was that part in the clock where it said, okay, this age is over. The golden age is going to begin. I think the Mayans really knew this stuff. They mm -hmm. must have been visited and, you know, they had this clock for themselves. It's the beginning of a new age. Yeah, a lot of people kind of went, okay, ufologists, you guys are a bunch of quacks. You know, nothing happened on 2012. You know, but I think it was really a transitional phase. And we're in that phase right now, and I think we're going to be in it for hundreds of years. I don't think this is going to be a gradual, or I think it's going to be a gradual, mm -hmm. gradual thing. But one of the other things about Dave, which is really cool, is that he seems to be the go-to guy now for insiders, right, for whistleblowers. And these guys are, uh, inc I respect them so much because they are risking their lives to get disclosure out there. Disclo they know mm -hmm. that disclosure is very, very much a part of the conscious awakening. So talk about disclosure. What is that? Well, disclosure is lifting the veil uh, of this box, this these invisible bars that we've all really been born into, and it's what we call a reality, but there are strings being pulled behind the scenes that are keeping all of the bad guys, that negative polarity uh, group of people um, which goes high up the ladder. It's not just human beings. There are other species involved. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very, it can be very, very scary. The thing for me, when I first started researching the cabal and the deep, how many people know what I'm talking about when I say deep state cabal, new order, mm -hmm. or new order, the band, <laughs> new world order, uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of names for it. Okay, that's good, because to be aware of this stuff is definitely a step in the process. And what scares me is that 
you know, Corey and Dave and other people are talking about, well, we need full disclosure. And I agree with that. Rip the Band-Aid off. Show humanity what is really, really going on. But there's another side to that. And that side is that people are going to lose their minds. You know, parts of religion are, it's going to be, mm-hmm. things are going to change. People that, you know, they base their lives on certain things and then everything is going to be in question. People are going to go nuts. People are going to be angry. When I first started researching this and found out about the cabal and all that, I became angry. I mean really, really angry. Because I was, I, I, I knew from a young mm-hmm. age that the wool was being pulled over my eyes. And then I verified it. And I'm like, oh, I cannot believe. What am I doing on this planet? Why would I choose to be here? I haven't yet figured out those reasons. <coughs> Jennifer's helping me do that. <laughs> here, here at Nourishing Journey. <coughs> Um, Yeah, so all these things are happening, and they're very much, I don't know if we want to get into it, because it's so negative. Yeah, we don't have to get into 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 that. But the the reason behind it. My point was, there's there's a, after a while, you realize that, okay, what they, because of all this stuff, and you're finding out all the stuff that's going on, it it generates fear, it generates confusion, Mm -hmm. which generates control. Which is what this whole society is about. Just to, just to dip a toe into it a little bit. It's about control and about fear. And there are beings that feed on that fear, which is what they call it's called louche. It's an energy of negativity that other other species actually feed on this. And it's part of the problem. But because of the new energies that we are now sitting in, it's incompatible with those negative energies and unfortunately of third density as well because it's a lower vibration. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be a very interesting time. I guarantee you guys stood in line to incarnate at this time. Stood in line. And it was a long line because this <laughs> is a super fun time to be alive and to be here because the experience, the catalysts that are going to be happening, you know, they may seem crazy and whatever, but there's going to be so much cool disclosure. I, I, I'm, I'm calling it right now. Actually, I didn't call it. Emory Smith called it. But what's interesting is I think... Antarctica, ironically, Gaia herself is going to be the one that's disclosing all this stuff because the ice down there is melting at a super fast rate. And soon enough, we're going to start to see these ancient, ancient civilizations, structures just pop up from underneath the ice. You know, and the government's going to go, okay, well, mm, the the ice is melting. Guess what popped up? We've got some people that were here quite a long time before us. Completely rewrite history. They know all this anyway. This is just, you know, drift, drift disclosure. A couple years later, once we can digest that, well, oh, well, okay, we got a couple of huge spaceships down here. Um, don't know what that's all about, so we'll have to take a couple of years and figure that out. I guarantee that's how it's going to happen. So, who here has been paying attention to what they're already starting to disclose? So, a lot of people. Anybody so, go to Contact in the Desert this, this year? I know. Pretty cool. Yeah, we're talking about maybe trying to bring something like that here. Yeah. Would you guys go? It would be totally awesome. Yeah. We need an East Coast contact. <laughs> yeah, we do. Contact. We do. And this one's the one to put it together. We'll do it. So why don't we talk about Corey? Yeah, yeah. Because one of the things that's cool about Dave Wilcock is that he it just seems to be the go-to guy for these guys, that, you know, the insiders. And Corey goes one of them. Um, Emery Smith is the other insider that he has right now that is really interesting dude. Um, but Corey specifically, anybody familiar? with what he's bringing out there. So, you know, I, I kind of put Corey off for a couple of years when I first heard because the information I was hearing was so far out there and I'm like, how could anybody possibly hide this from me? I, so I put it off because I was just in disbelief mm-hmm. until I, I started following his work and I'm like, oh my God. I, and I'm telling you, this I, I, I met him. He's telling the truth. I, I mean, I feel I'm a pretty good barometer when somebody is lying to me, and Corey Good is telling the truth. And the truth is really hard to digest. There's a whole, just a quick recap, there's a whole breakaway civilization that happened back in the 50s on Earth. There's a massive, several s- secret space programs. We have bases all over the back side of the moon that Corey calls the Lu- Lunar Operations Command. We have bases on Mars. We have bases on the, in the rings of Saturn. We have bases around Jupiter. We have aircraft that are capable of um, going past the Oort cloud. They've studied it all. We are everywhere. We have 
the ability to step through portals and end up on another planet or another place. Mm -hmm. We have civilizations living underneath the Earth, specifically called the Anshar is one of them. I think there's about at least seven. Corey has visited and is in contact with several beings from the center of the Earth and frequently gets taken up to the Lunar Operations Command. He gets taken to this high-tech conference room in, in the rings of Saturn. That's the coolest part yeah. for me, right? <laughs> Cor Corey will be in his house, and he will, this blue sphere will come into his living room. And he'll say, okay, his mind will go, all right, I gotta get some clothes on. So he gets dressed, sits there, he goes, all right, I'm ready. This thing moves over him, the next thing he knows, he's standing by a fern in a lobby of an incredibly high-tech but incredibly ancient building out uh, in Ju is Jupiter's orbit, right? It's not Saturn, it's Jupiter's orbit. And he'll walk in, and there will be all these, there will be f roughly 52 beings from what he calls the local 52 star cluster. So apparently there are 52 other worlds like ours that are more advanced, that are already in this confederation of planets. If you, it's very Star Trek, to be honest with you, very much so. And he is basically being groomed to be our spokesperson for Earth because he's an intuitive empath. He was groomed at a very young age. And he's in communication with, I'm just going to say it, an eight-foot-tall blue bird. It's called a blue avian. And Corey asks, you know, what is your name? When they speak telepathically. And Corey asks, what, is, what should I call you? And the blue bird says, my name is Ra, Tear Air. Are you the author of the Law of One? Yep. So Corey is actually telepathically communicating and physically meeting the actual entity that Carla, Jim, and Don were channeling back in the 80s. Now that is incredible. So there's some correlations here that are you know, really, really, really interesting to me. Is there anything else you wanted to tap into? Yeah, so yeah. Your eyes. yeah. Good, good. Okay. So there, the Sphere Being Alliance consists of, I think it's either four or five entities. Rotir is one of them. There's another being that is often there in these meetings. He calls it the Triangle Head being, being, which is, people are, we don't like that. It's kind of a derogatory comment, but he doesn't know what else to call them. Cause it, it, there's never been a name given, but they literally are a golden stick figure kind of being that's very tall that has a triangular golden head. I, seems kind of insect-like to me, but I, I don't really know. One of the other beings in that sphere being alliance are these huge spheres. And when I say huge, I mean the size of the moon would be a smaller one. The size of uh, you know one of our larger planets would be one of the larger ones. And they were systematically put out throughout our, our, our little solar system here. And the reason for that was that they were there and they were diffusing the new energies that our solar system was moving into because they know we are not ready consciously. They know that the harvest is going to be small. The positive harvest, according to Ra, is going to be less than 17% of the population. The negative harvest, way, way smaller than that. So unfortunately, most of us are going to be repeating third density. Um, but those spheres were put in our solar system to diffuse that kind of information because we weren't ready. There was also a, um, I mentioned the, the space station out in, with the confederation out in the, the orbit of Jupiter. That group of beings had put some kind of thought force field mm -hmm. around our entire solar system. So that and all the spheres are now gone. That means we're feeling the full brunt of, of whatever this energy is. Our sun is completely getting af being affected by it, which is affecting us. You know, this whole thing about planet Earth, about our being, our fault, heating up the planet Earth is, no, our footprint is so small, it's ridiculous. This is a cyclical thing that's happening, and if you look, it's not just us that's heating mm -hmm. up. It's everything, things are happening differently on Saturn, they're happening different on every planet in our solar system. It's being affected because our sun, our, our little logos, is radiating a different kind of energy because of the energies that we are now in, in a different part of the galaxy. And Dave and Corey talk about this on, how many people watch Cosmic Disclosure? Okay, great. <clears throat> they talk about this all the time, about this solar, this series of solar flares that we're going to have. And uh, this information is coming from Ra to your air. And they said it, it's going to be a series of X-class flares 
and it's going to be between now and 2023. And this could be the mass event. The that, event. <laughs> yeah, it could be a crazy event. Yeah. So just be ready for anything. It's just remember, though, it's always, don't be in fear. It's always a positive. It's always for the good. You know, the problem is Earth herself is in forward, fourth density. We're not. We're a third density species, and it creates an incredible amount of disharmony on the planet. Volcanoes in Hawaii, crazy um, hurricanes, all this weather, earthquakes, all this stuff. That you, I, get, I have an earthquake app. There's an earthquake, a major earthquake of five and over every two, every couple minutes on the planet. Wow. The crust, you know, when you have that disharmony between the third density uh, surface population and the fourth density Earth itself, that disharmony, it's, it creates entropy and it creates unusable heat. Well, that's got to be, it's got to get out of there somehow, and that's how it happens all these breaks in the crust, the volcanoes and all that. So there's going to be a lot of weird things that are going on that we're going to experience. Well, okay, so let's talk about, I mean, the whole purpose here is our ascension. Yeah. And and I'm assuming for most people here, probably the polarization to the positive yeah. in service of others. So what does this mean for us? And, and what, are, what do we need to do? What are we experiencing? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's pretty simple, really. You know, and it's obvious to all of us. So I'm just going to say it. Love everyone. That's the most. And Corey says this too. You know, we co-create our and mani- literally manifest our own experiences. Yet a lot of people are not aware of that. They think it's just hogwash. And that's the information that's been kept from us. We need to get off of our knees. We need to take control of what is going on and just love everything. Because that you know that is that love energy is behind everything. It's it's you know it's who you truly are. You are that love. energy. Right? We can feel this. So if you love everything, you know, you're just loving yourself because remember, we're all one. So if you do that, if you have gratitude for everything in life, and I mean, if you're walking down the road, you see a beautiful tree, take a second, just go, wow, oh, that's amazing. And that's also part of you. Because w- when you're in a state of gratitude, you're in a state of love. You do that all the time, you're going to be polarized and positive. And I think that's what most of us would like to do, right? So that, and the other thing that really is an excellent tool is to forgive. You know, forgiveness is just an incredible thing. It literally stops the karmic wheel. When you're forgiving someone else, you're also really forgiving yourself. You know, more importantly, if you have issues in your life in past, just dig deep, meditate. I don't care if you are sitting in a chair and that's the way you do it, or if you're out in nature and you could call it something like walking meditation. You know, all that is important as long as you can connect with your higher self connect with you know all that that beautiful energy and just forgive have gratitude and love everything if we do that we're gonna be okay if we do if everybody did that overnight it would absolutely change the world you know Dave Wilcock always talks about this one experiment where um, they took I think it was like 7,000 people sat down and did a mass mm-hmm. meditation I don't know how they monitored this but it decreased the all the bad stuff on the planet, murder rate, crime rate, all this stuff, hate, everything, by 72% during that meditation. That's insane. You want to talk about the power of co-creation, that's just 7,000 people. Yeah. You know? And call it, like, the c- calling is another important thing that we should really talk about because, you know, Ross says this, he says, you know, we can't, because of violating the w- law of free will, we cannot come unless there is a sufficient amount of people calling out to them. And that happened, long, and it's not a big number. Again, it, uh, the number, uh, they say the number of people calling, the square of the number of people calling has to be greater than the number of people that are not seeking or not searching. Mm-hmm. Well, let's just, take, let's just make it simple and take the population of the, of, of the planet, which is a little over 7 billion. So let's just do 7 billion. Well, what's the square root of 7 billion? Any mathematicians? It's roughly 84,000, and I know that because I asked Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> it's 84 and change. That's not a lot of people for a six-density social memory complex that knows a hell of a lot more than we do to come here and say, all right, we're going to help you out. So we got to listen. This stuff, this material, for me and Jen, I know for you, it's just mm-hmm. so, so important. Yeah. yeah, we have to get out and speak it. Yeah, we really do. we got to get it out there. You gotta make people aware of it. You gotta make people aware that they, you know, they, they really need to make this choice. And that everybody's gonna want, obviously, for the most part, polarized positive. What does that mean? 
suddenly we're living on a planet where everybody's helping everyone and everyone's loving. That's the way, that's the way fourth density is going to be. At least positive. You know, because you've got these two. I never did mention that, actually. In third <laughs> density, it splits. So, you know, I said the negative goes to one 4D planet, positive goes to the other. So what happens is that you go first, second, third. Fourth density has its own positive and negative existence. So does fifth. And in sixth, it regroups. Because if you remember, sixth density is a density of unity. And that's why Ross says that the negative polarity is an extremely different polarity. Because when you come into sixth density as a negative polarized entity that went through millions, maybe billions of years of being that negativity, at some point you got to do a complete 180 and understand that you are part of everything and part of that love energy and, and one creator. So it's kind of cool. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. <laughs> so I'm curious in talking about like karma. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Because you know a lot of us talk about karma and you know, we're, we're good people, we try to do good things, and we're creating good karma. Well, yeah. what happens to someone who maybe is self-serving? Well, you know, and it's not just this lifetime. It's the accumulation of all of mm -hmm. your incarnations. Um, Ra describes karma as inertia. So it's, it's kind of difficult to explain, but, you know, once you... It's all about energy, so if you perform something of a very negative energy, it's going to cling on to you, it's going to stick, and at some point you're going to have to balance that out, right? Because it's all about balance. It's all about the duality system. So, if you do something bad, eventually you're going to pay for it, or you're going to be, you're going to have some kind of catalyst in your in your life that you've set up. By the way, all these events mm -hmm. that happen in your life, pay attention because these they're called catalysts. And when a catalyst happens, really you got to learn from it because if you don't, it's going to keep happening. And ha if you're one of those people that just sweeps your problems underneath the rug, you're going to keep getting hit in the face with the same catalyst. It may come up in different ways, but pay attention because you're here <laughs> to learn. Remember, it's all about experience. <laughs> Be grateful for the difficult times. Yes. <laughs> Look at it as an opportunity to learn, you know? Well, so that also makes me want to ask. You had mentioned that we have people who have stayed back to help. Oh, wanderers. The wanderers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yeah, totally. Awesome. So wanderers, according to the law of one, are upper fourth, fifth, and sixth density entities that have chosen to incarnate back here on Earth, anywhere really, but we're going to talk about third density specifically, into the third density, underneath the veil, risking forgetting everything that they have learned and were in four, fifth, and sixth. Let's just say it's a sixth density entity like Ra. So a piece of Ra, Ra's conscience decides to break off, incarnates back in third density because they're answering the calling of that 84,000 and change that we know from Alexa. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> And comes here to help us wake up. So Don actually asked Ra, and this is in 1981, well, how many wanderers are there here on planet Earth right now? And Ra said uh, 60, 65 million, right? Is that right? Yeah, 65 I so, million. Yeah. I don't remember the numbers like you do. 65 million. So, it, it, you know, 30, 40 years later, it's thought that there are a heck of a lot more wanderers here right now. You know, from a positive polarity standpoint, being a wanderer and choosing that path is incredibly brave. From the negative, incredibly foolish. Because you're, you're risking everything. You're risking getting caught up in that karmic wheel, developing that karma. And you may not go back to a positive. You may not choose that path. You may go negative. Mm -hmm. That actually happened. This is a kind of cool exa example. I'll, I'll do it real quick. On When Ra was in third density, a, a two positive polarity entities from, I believe it was fifth density, came back, chose to in, incarnate back in third density to help Ra, to help those uh, polarize, those that were confused and were not aware that they needed to make a choice. And they came back with the intention to work together to po polarize everybody in a positive way. But instead, what happened was they saw that there was um, a better way to get back to the Creator, and that was creating this system of two, uh, there's a holy war where they were on opposite sides and they actually became caught up in karma and negatively polarized themselves. And at, Ra does say in, in, at the end of the third density, nobody polarized negative. They had 6.5 million people uh, polarize positive, which ended up being the entity of Ra. But it would be, the, Venus had only a population of 64 and a half um, million at that time. Very small planet. It was much farther from the sun at that time, too. Um, inhabitable, uh, not, not habitable at this, at this time. But these two entities 
um, ended up going through the polarizing negative, polarized themselves, harvested themselves during the period, uh, went through almost all of fourth density in the negative fashion, and it wasn't until the end of fourth density where they, through a lot of work, re realized what they had done, repolarized themselves back to the positive and joined Ra, because the, the social memory complex of Ra is a fourth density phenomenon. It usually happens in late fourth density. So I just, I just find that an interesting yeah. example how, how things, if you're an entity and you come back, how it can go very, very differently than what you expect. It's a huge risk. And there are a lot of people on Earth right now that are, that are helping us you know, get, get into 4D here. So it's pretty much appreciated for you wanderers out there, light workers, star seeds, whatever you, whatever you want to call yourselves, <laughs> indigos. It's, 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 from my point of view, it's all the same thing. I think we have some in here. I think we have a few, probably. <laughs> All right. One of the other things I know you wanted to talk about was also um, chakras, and how do chakras play into all of this? Uh, me, one of the few people that actually say chakra. I like it because that's the <laughs> actual. San is it Sanskrit? Is that the actual pronunciation? So many people say chakra. Yeah. Um, but you know way more about this than I do. So why don't I just talk about the activation and the balance between mm -hmm. third and fourth density? So. If we go, if you're polarizing in the positive fashion, you know, you've got your, your seven, seven, seven chakras, <laughs> and it's all about activating that, that heart, that green ray, and radiating that love out there towards everyone else. Why? Because you're in service to others. So it's all about getting that activated and having a nice balance between all of them, basically, for a po positive polarization. Now, in the negative sense, we're skipping over that love center of energy. Or you can look at it as being turned around 180 mm -hmm. degrees and all that love is just being you know, towards yourself because that's all the negative polarity is about. Thank you for the head shake once again. <laughs> so uh, that's, what the, that's what the change is in the 4D in terms of chakras. But it's really it's about the balance more than anything. And Ross says that actually the crown chakra is not an energy center at all. It's more of a thermometer mm -hmm. to figure out the balance of what's going on and it's really that balance between all of them that is really crucial in moving you up in vibration. You know, because a density really, density shouldn't be, density, the definition of a density is really a level of consciousness. It's not, when we're talking about densities, we're not talking about dimensions. Dimension is a, is a spatial concept. Density is a concept of spiritual mass. So the higher up in density you go, the more spiritual mass you have, the more, you know, dense it is, ironically enough. And the lighter your physical body becomes. So I'm told. So we're told. So we're told. Are you still here? <laughs> um, okay, so I guess we also wanted to talk about real quickly just some of your own personal experiences before we get into last thoughts. Yeah, I, you know, I talk about those catalysts, and I just talk about the latest catalyst I have. I had. Um, I've, the cu last couple of years, I've been feeling this pull or this energy, if you will, to get into ufology and spirituality and consciousness and all that stuff. And I knew no one in this field. I mean, no one. I watched Ancient Aliens and Cosmic Disclosure and stuff yeah. like that. And that's about, <laughs> you know, that's about. I mean, I've read a thousand books, but um, you know, that's all I was really into. And I just kept feeling this energy, like you need to, you need to do whatever, whatever, whatever. And I kept until I met my wife a few years ago. I was very much alone in this whole journey. I was afraid to talk about it, and when I did, I was either like, you're crazy, my, even my good friends. Very few people in my life understood it until I met my wife, which is a catalyst right there, because mm -hmm. it allowed me to be sitting here talking about it today. It allowed us to meet, right? So back in February, I'm meditating, I'm saying, okay, universe, higher self, whatever's going on here, I'm going to stop swimming upstream, I'm just going to give in to that universal energy, and I'm just going to go with this. And I, I felt this weight just lift off my shoulders. Like I said, I knew no one in the ufology community. I didn't know. I just like, okay, cool, whatever. Two weeks later, I am doing Fade to Black with Jimmy Church and Coast to Coast AM. Now, for those of you who don't know, those are the two biggest radio platforms in the world for ufology, consciousness, paranormal, the whole, you know, the whole gamut of it. That happened in two weeks, and I knew no one. I'm not going to bore you with the process and how that happened, but my point is, as soon as you let go with that energy and stop resisting what is, all this stuff happens. And from, was it Faded Black? Mm -hmm. Faded Black, Jennifer was listening to that. 
she had the courage to email somebody she thought never in a million years would come out to Columbia, Maryland <laughs> and do this, right? And yet here I am. Why? My sister lives down the street. <laughs> I was going to be here anyway. I said, hey, did July 2nd open for you? It's been this one after the other of these synchronistic events that are just ha just laying in front of both of us, really. It's really incredible once you just stop resisting. When I think for all of us, we can probably say how many of us have been hiding our authenticity about a lot of this stuff because we're afraid of what others might think. How many of you have actually decided to take that step and move forward to, to be out there and, and to be the weirdo geeking out about all this stuff and helping others see the light? <laughs> Right? Okay. It's pretty cool. It's a good thing. It's important. Just be yourself. You know, get it out there. People need to know. So what's in, what's in your future? I don't know. I'm just going downstream. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever happens next, uh, you know, we have some pretty cool things that we're talking about doing. Um, uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, there could be some really cool project coming up with Corey and David. We'll see how that pans out. Um, but other than that, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to do my best to be my true self and Love everybody, have gratitude all the time, and forgive as much as I can, especially myself. So it's, it's really, yeah, it's, it's a journey, guys, but take it. And just remember, you know, we're all one in the end. you got to realize that. The way we treat each other is just so important. Why would you treat your other self poorly when it's yourself? I love that. <laughs> yeah.